and my key grip and my assistant key grip. Okay, this is week four of basic Christianity. And we are, we're going through a series looking at John Stott's book, Basic Christianity. And I'm spending two weeks on the uh, proofs of the resurrection because this is something that, uh, that I hear a lot and just what's been going on for some time, people having a notion that the resurrection didn't actually happen. And I hear some crazy things, such as the resurrection of Jesus is a metaphor for, and then fill in your appropriate pet topic, a metaphor for how we need to rise up and uh, get rid of income inequality, or how we need to rise up and stop polluting, and all this nonsense. Anyway, that people see it as a metaphor. So uh, last time, we're in the, the handout that I gave you, and we are on... Oh, something like uh, page the two. Morning that sounds about right. Yes, page two. So let's see what we looked at. We looked at various um, theories that have been put forth that seem to go around on the internet um, and in various groups about how uh, the resurrection didn't actually happen, where uh, perhaps, uh, let's see, the, the disciples, actually they hallucinated seeing Jesus. All of them did. How the disciples stole the body. How the witnesses went to the wrong tomb. And uh, how he didn't really die. He just was mostly dead. Uh, and all these different theories. How uh, just the idea about how Jesus was resurrected was embellished over the centuries. So we um, looked at all those different theories last time. Now, we continue on. And... Looking at, uh, so, a uh, thing about uh, evidence, these are not theories that compete equally with the biblical accounts. And we looked at how the biblical accounts were not written as fables, but they were written by people who were eyewitnesses as eyewitness accounts, meaning it's clear when you read them that the people who wrote them were saying, this is what I saw, this is what I witnessed, and uh, I want to pass this along. Now, there's very strong evidence by historian standards for the reliability of the New Testament accounts. And these various theories that we looked at yesterday don't account for the evidence that, uh, that we have for the resurrection. These theories we talked about last week enjoy popularity because they excite people's interest in another version of Jesus. They give people what they want to hear, not necessarily the truth. And they seem to come with good authority. Whether good authority is Bar uh, Bart Ehrman, uh, or various scholars, or uh, some guy who sounded smart on the internet, it comes with good authority. And it's useful to know the facts behind the reliability of scripture, and to understand that these alternate theories fall in the realm of conspiracy theories. So what I want to look now is, uh, last time I looked at false theories trying to explain away the resurrection. Now today I want to look at evidence for the resurrection. Uh, so when I think about evidence, uh, remember the name Timothy McVeigh? Okay. So Timothy McVeigh, he uh, did the Oklahoma City uh, bombing, the federal building bombing. Yeah. Um, I guess that was about 96, I think, something like that. Yeah, so about 20 some years ago. There were no eyewitnesses uh, to him actually doing it. Uh, but there was lots of circumstantial evidence that led to his conviction. So I want to talk about circumstantial evidence right now. So even though there were no eyewitnesses, and often, uh, at least uh, on TV shows like Perry Mason, they would, um, they would say, you know, uh, objection, circumstantial evidence. And yeah, you can't convict someone on circumstantial evidence, but when there's enough of it, it's, uh, it works. So in the court proceedings uh, against Timothy McVeigh, there were 137 witnesses. Again, nobody saw him do it, but 137 witnesses and 700 exhibits, including there was a fellow who rented him the truck, there was a friend he talked to about bombing a building. Mm. Now, that's not enough to convict someone because you talked to someone about bombing a building, but there was a scientist who found explosives residue on his clothing. Uh, there was a truck key that was an exhibit. There was a taxi receipt, a motel bill. A bill from a Chinese restaurant was given as circumstantial evidence. Mm. 
Uh, now, circumstantial evidence can be powerful enough to lead to overwhelming conclusions. And so he was convicted for doing it, even though there were no eyewitnesses. So what I want to look at is what circumstantial evidence can convince us that Jesus rose from the dead. So exhibit one, the disciples died for their beliefs. This in itself, and none of this circumstantial evidence is enough to convict uh, to say, yes, Jesus definitely rose from the dead. But when you put it all together, just like the evidence that was against Timothy McVeigh, it makes a compelling case. So exhibit one, the disciples died for their beliefs. When Jesus was crucified, his followers were discouraged and, depressed, and I'm sorry, depressed. They no longer had confidence that Jesus had been sent by God. They believed that anyone crucified had been cursed by God. So they dispersed. And at least momentarily, the Jesus movement had been momentarily stopped in its tracks. And then after a short bit of time, we see them regathering, committing themselves to spreading a very specific message that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of God who died on a cross, returned to life, and was seen alive by them. And they spent the rest of their lives proclaiming this without any reward from a secular standpoint. So these disciples who excuse me, were downcast that their, who they thought was their Messiah had been killed, and now they're back saying he's alive. Uh, they faced a life of hardship. They often went without food. They slept exposed to the elements. They were ridiculed, beaten, imprisoned. Many of them were tortured and executed. And you think, for what? Well, they were convinced beyond a shadow of the doubt that they had seen Jesus Christ alive, risen from the dead. And it is difficult to explain how this group of men came up with this belief unless they had actually seen Jesus risen from the dead. Now, a skeptic might say that many people die for their beliefs. Many, um, many people die for false beliefs. Uh, the followers of David Koresh, the, the Hale-Bopp crowd, that was something that happened in 1997. Uh, they died for a belief. Uh, many uh, Muslims, uh, a lot of people around the world, die for a belief. But there's a crucial difference between all of them and the disciples who died for the belief in Jesus risen. Um, any of those groups that I just mentioned may be willing to die for their belief. Uh, for example, Muslims may be willing to die for the belief that Allah revealed himself to Muhammad. But they, they're not in a position to know that. Nobody else is in a position to know for certain what happened with Muhammad. They, but they have a belief that they were taught. But Jesus' followers, here's the crucial difference I'm getting at, were attesting to the fact that they saw him alive, meaning they were in a position to know whether or not he was al they saw him alive or dead. And so if they were making it up, then they would have known that it was a lie. They were in a position to know whether it was true or a lie. People will die for their religious beliefs if they sincerely believe that they're true. But people won't die for their religious beliefs if they know for a fact that it's a lie. And uh, the, again, if it was a lie, if the resurrected Jesus was a lie, the disciples were in a position to know that it was a lie. And I don't believe that they would have died for that lie. While most people can only have faith that their beliefs are true, the disciples were in a position to know without a doubt whether or not Jesus had actually risen from the dead. And if they weren't absolutely certain, they wouldn't have allowed themselves, I believe, to be tortured to death for proclaiming that the resurrection happened. Right, any questions on that or comments? Okay. Exhibit two, the conversion of skeptics. Do I have this written out as exhibits? I don't know what I wrote. I don't know what I wrote. Oh, okay. Sounds cooler when I say it that way. Okay, I'm court case. I, I get the, the way I'm phrasing it. Uh, I get it from... Um, uh, Lee Strobel, the way he wrote the case for Christ, oh. talking as a as a legal uh, legal expert. Okay, the conversion of skeptics. There were hardened skeptics who didn't believe in Jesus before his crucifixion, and most notably, we can think of Saul of Tarsus, uh, who turned around and adopted the Christian faith after Jesus' death. If they were opposed to him when he was alive. His being dead should not have helped matters. Meaning, uh, good, he's dead. You know, from the standpoint of someone who is opposed to Jesus, they would have been thinking, okay, good, he's dead, that's done with. Um, 
And yet, a lot of these people converted, not by listening to Jesus' teaching, but after something wonderful happened. So what happened? They must have experienced the resurrected Jesus. Uh, and examples, as I mentioned, Saul of Tarsus, later uh, Paul, or James, the brother of Jesus. The historian Josephus wrote that James was stoned to death because of his belief in his brother. Paul, uh, he was, as a Pharisee, he hated anything that disrupted the traditions of the Jewish people. To him, Christianity was a counter-movement that was undermining uh, Judaism. It was the height of disloyalty. Saul led executions of Christians. Then suddenly, he doesn't just ease off the Christians, but he joins their movements, and he does the things that we read about that he does for Christianity. Now, how does this happen? Paul tells us in Galatians how he saw the risen Christ and heard Christ appoint him to be one of his followers. Not only that, but then he performed miracles to back up his claim to be an apostle of Jesus. And I'll take a breather. Any thoughts? Talking too fast so you don't have time to think. <laughs> All right. Usually my students are furiously copying down equations that I write on the board. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, the third thing. Changes to key social structures. So we're examining today um, what if, you know, looking at it from the perspective that a lot of people want to believe, Jesus did not actually rise from the dead. And we think about could these things, these exhibits I'm putting forth to you, could these things have happened if Jesus didn't really rise from the dead? So changes to key social structures among the Jews. So some background information. In Jesus' time, the Jews had been persecuted for uh, 700 years by somebody, by the Babylonians, by the Assyrians, by the Persians, by the Greeks, and at this point in time, by the Romans. There was always someone persecuting them for many, many centuries. Many had been scattered, living as captives in other lands. And so the Jews for centuries had it rough, being scattered, coming back to the homeland, being scattered. But we still see Jews today. We don't see Assyrians. We don't see Babylonians. We don't see Persians, uh, by that name anyway. And why? because these groups got captured by other nations, and you just look through all the Old Testament, the uh, Jebusites, the Hittites, all these groups, we don't see these groups anymore. Um, these groups got captured by other nations, they intermarried, they lost their national identity, um, but the Jews still remain today. One reason we can, sociologists can look at it and say that the social structures that gave Jews their identity were unbelievably important to them. The Jews would pass these social structures, uh, just how, basically how to be a Jew. Uh, they would pass it down to their children. They would celebrate them in their synagogue every Sabbath, Sabbath and reinforce them with rituals. Because they knew that if they didn't, that their identity would be lost. They would be assimilated by other cultures, as we've seen uh, these other cultures in, uh, from ancient times assimilated by other cultures. Also, they believed that God himself had entrusted these traditions to them. To them, it was interlinked with their salvation. And so now, in the first century, a rabbi named Jesus comes along. He teaches for three years, gains a following of lower and middle class folks, gets in trouble with the authorities, and gets crucified. But five weeks later, over 10,000 Jews are following him and claiming that he is the initiator of a new religion. This was big, you know, as I said, Saul saw this as the height of disloyalty. They totally overturned what it meant to be a Jew following a guy, and he's not even alive anymore. He had been crucified. He was now dead, or so they thought. 10,000 Jews following him, and they were willing to give up or at least alter five, all five of the social institutions that they had been taught since childhood that had such importance something very big must have happened. So I want to talk about those five social structures that they abandoned or altered. And the first one is since the times of Abraham and Moses, they had been taught that they need an animal sacrifice annually to atone for sins. 
the idea was that God would transfer their sins to that animal. After the death of Jesus, the Jews who followed him no longer uh, needed that. They said, we don't need an animal sacrifice. The second one, Jews emphasized obeying the laws given by God, the Torah. It's what separated them from the pagan nations. And now, the Jews following Jesus said that they were beginning to say that you don't become an upstanding member of their community merely by keeping the law. There's more to it than that. The third one is Jews kept the Sabbath by not doing anything except uh, religious devotion on Saturday. And this 1,500-year tradition was abruptly changed. The, these Christians, uh, again, they're still Jews, but now they are followers of Christ. They are worshiping on Sunday. Why? Because that's when Jesus rose from the dead. So after a 1,500-year tradition of the Sabbath, Saturday, being the day of rest, finally, now you have this group saying, there's a more important day of the week. There's Sunday. Jews believed in monotheism, only one God. The Christian view of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as one God is radically different from what Jews believed. They considered this either polytheism or some kind of heresy, uh, that, that someone could be both man and God. So from a Jewish perspective, bringing in this Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that would have been seen as polytheism. And yet the Jews began to worship this man, this man who had been killed, they began to worship him as God. And the fifth is that the Christians pictured the Messiah as someone who suffered and died for the sins of the world. Jews had an idea of the Messiah coming, but they believed that Messiah would be a political leader who would destroy the Roman armies, a political leader who would politically and socially free them from oppressors. <laughs> So those are five things that you have this group of thousands of Jews who had these traditions that had been going on for centuries and suddenly they were looking at things a totally different way. Now, you look at how can you explain why in a short time, period of time, not just one Jew, not just a handful, but an entire community of at least 10,000 Jews were willing to give up these key ideas and beliefs that had served them both socially and theologically for so many centuries. And the answer is they had seen the risen Jesus from the dead. They knew something very special had happened. Today, many people are fluid in their faith, uh, picking and choosing religions that sound good. Uh, and it wasn't like that with the Jews. Uh, it wasn't that they came upon ideas that sounded better. They weren't looking for an excuse to rebel against tradition but something wonderful happened. They were, they were actually, it seems, very content with their traditions, but they gave up those traditions because they had witnessed a miracle. All right, thoughts on that? Nice thing about YouTube is you can change the speed and you can play me in slow motion. <laughs> Who's that fellow? Uh, the, uh, the yeah, sometimes we watch YouTube videos. The Ben Shapiro, I don't know if y'all ever see him. Ben Shapiro, very smart, call him a kid, very smart uh, young man, but to listen to him, I, uh, I have to put YouTube on slow motion just to follow him. Uh. Usually on YouTube, I have to put it speed up, but some people need to slow down. <laughs> Maybe I'm one of those. Okay. <clears throat> Exhibit four, the emergence of the church. The, the Christian church started shortly after the death of Jesus, and it spread very rapidly. It reached Rome in about 20 years. People look at, um, you know, that they look at over the centuries how Christianity spread through Europe, and people say, well, that was political influence. That was, they had Constantine behind it. That was the Roman Empire spreading it. Okay, that is fast-forwarding to the fourth century, but it's glossing over the first few centuries where there was not political influence of Christianity. Uh, this movement that is Christianity, it eventually overwhelmed a number of competing ideolo ideologies in the Roman Empire. So if you were an outside observer, if you could go back and look at the first century in Europe and uh, look at these, these different groups, which do you think would survive? Uh, first of all, you have the Christians, a ragtag 
group of people whose primary message is that a crucified carpenter from a small village had been raised from the dead, or the Roman Empire. Well, looking at them, you would say, okay, this little group that's just a cult, they're going to fade out, but the Roman Empire is Rome, and Rome is eternal. Um, but you look, which group did survive and continue to flourish and spread around the world? What's well, Christianity? Something amazing happened with the growth of the church. Earlier, you had talked about uh, Christianity, excuse me, uh, Judaism being uh, persecuted by the various nations. Yes. And you listed Rome as one of them. What was the religion of Rome during this time period? Okay, Rome had officially, Rome had what we call syncretism, which means believe what you want to believe. As long as you worship Caesar <laughs> as, <laughs> as the god of Rome, um, you can have whatever religion you want. And so there was, no, you know, Rome very spread out, so you've got a lot of actual um, mini uh, cultures, I guess subcultures within the Roman Empire. And they, they weren't going to mandate, here is the one religion, except for what I just said. So it was, uh, they said, you do what you want. So the Jews, y'all do your Jewish thing, and over in Spain and up in Britain, you know, however far the Roman Empire got, do whatever you want, whatever your culture has you believe, however... Uh, you will worship <laughs> Caesar, <laughs> whoever the Caesar is, uh, because uh, he is he is God, uh, not in the sense of creator of the universe. Now, there was also the Roman gods and from the Greek gods that we know of, Jupiter and, and Neptune and all those things. But uh, those were, you know, those were beliefs, but basically it was as long as you acknowledge that Caesar is God, you can believe whatever else you want. So... The Jews, what, this was uh, tough for the Jews because they were not going to worship Caesar as God. So there was a lot of uh, butting heads, you know, between the Roman Empire, hundreds of miles away from, from the Jews. So basically what Rome decided, uh, the, you think the Middle East was kind of far away, it was hard to manage from Rome. And so what they said, they put governors and they even installed a high priest. And so the Jews, they are, there are actually two high priests in, uh, in Israel, uh, which got a little tricky because the Jews said, according to what, uh, what the Bible, uh, according to what our Bible says, this is how we install a high priest. The Romans said, we're going to install a high priest for you. So there were two high priests, a real one and a Roman authority one. But generally, the Romans, the Roman Empire said, Okay, we're going to let you, there, it was kind of a look the other way. We're going to let y'all basically manage yourselves. We're going to put a governor over you. We're going to let y'all manage yourselves. But as long as you pay taxes to us, um, we'll just let you do whatever you want. So it was a tension there. Uh, they were not going to worship Caesar. And then so when, when they were asking Jesus, is it right to give uh, taxes? Is it right to you know pay Caesar taxes or not? They were trying to trip him up because to a Jew, there was no right answer uh, to questions like that. Uh, so they just kind of looked the other way at uh, the Jews. Okay, they were worshiping God, and we'll just look the other way and collect our taxes from them. But did I answer your question? No, sometimes Thanks, I'll go off on the tangent. Okay. All right. What are we talking about here? Um, exhibits. The emergence of the church. Okay. As we examine the circumstantial evidence... We think, what other explanation is there except that Jesus rose from the dead? There's a fellow, uh, a lawyer, named Lionel Luck, who, I think he's passed away, who's considered the world's most successful lawyer. He's written about in Guinness Book of World Records with 245 consecutive murder acquittals. Uh, he was British, I think. And he subjected the historical facts about the resurrection to his own rigorous analysis for several years. And... Uh, he wrote, he said, I say unequivocally that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. A similar story, uh, Lee Strobel, whom I've mentioned a bit, he wrote The Case for Christ, mm -hmm. and then a series of other books, The Case for, uh, began with him, uh, he was atheist, and he was a... Uh, 
he was the, the legal, the head legal writer for the Chicago Tribune. And so he, he had some, uh, this legal expertise that he always wrote about uh, legal things, and he decided to uh, put to the test by, uh, with legal scrutiny, which is the kind of what I've brought up here in my class, but uh, about the truthfulness of the resurrection, the truthfulness of the biblical story of Jesus. And he set out to write a book disproving the resurrection. And in the course of writing it, he slowly came around and came out with The Case for Christ, which was a book proving, <laughs> showing the, the resurrection to be true. Um, do I have an essay written for you on the last page? Yeah. Okay. Ad adapted from a sermon by Dr. James Allen Francis called One Solitary Life. I'd like to read it to you. Here is a man who was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30, then for three years he was an itinerant preacher. He never owned a home, he never wrote a book, he never held an office, he never had a family. He never went to college, he never put his foot inside a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place he was born. He never did one of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. While still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed upon a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for his garments. The only property he had on earth, his coat. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Twenty centuries have come and gone. I think when it was originally written, that said 19, so I've added to that. Right. Uh, come and gone, and today, he, the central figure of the human race. I'm well within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that were ever built, all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as has that one solitary life. If there was no resurrection, I don't believe that this one life, Jesus, could have been the most influential of all time. Uh, there was something miraculous he did, and it wasn't just his teachings. It wasn't just, as Douglas Adams, the author of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, said that he taught people that they should be nice to each other. He did something miraculous. Uh, he split time in half, B.C. and A.D. We all recognize. We try to call it now Common Era and before Common Era, but uh, too late. Okay, time has been split in half by Jesus. He has influenced art, music, philosophy, politics, law more than any other single life. And so the question is how, unless the resurrection is true. Okay, so this has been two weeks on proof of the resurrection. Share it with your friends. Uh, we will continue on uh, next week looking at John Stott's book, Basic Christianity. We're going to look at uh, getting away from looking at Jesus and now looking at, uh, well, we'll come back to Jesus, don't worry. But we're going to look next week at sin, what exactly sin is, how that affects uh, our lives, how that affects life. Any questions, thoughts, concerns, comments? All right, well, that'll do it. Thank you very much. And I'll see you all next week.